questions. The speakers are all under the whip, no more than eight minutes, so there will be time for questions at the end. Um, it is being videoed and will be used extensively by WTM between now and next year's World Travel Market. So bear in mind if you ask a question that you're going to be recorded for posterity. Uh, very keen to have those questions and that's partly why they're under the whip um, to get through this very quickly so that we can come on and have time for questions at the end. We're going to start with Sally Grayson from People and Places, go on to Dave Coles, then Vicky Smith, and we'll end with Abta and Nikki White. Um, so half an hour from now, uh, we should be ready for your questions. So Sally, can I ask you to say um, something about People and Places and what it's doing? Morning, everyone. Thank you very much. The mic's working. Okay, if I start now, I, st I still... Uh, ah, here we go. My name's Sally Grayson. Uh, <clears throat> I'm co-founder co of an organization called People and Places. Uh, we match skilled volunteers to local community need. But I'm not here to talk about People and Places today particularly. We started People and Places to campaign for better volunteering better volunteering for communities and volunteers. Small plug, we won the campaigning award yesterday, so we're making the right noises somewhere. And I did a presentation last year on what I thought were the priorities, what we think are the priorities for responsible volunteering. And I gave some examples of good and bad practice. And I want to talk today about the good news and the bad news. The steps forward we've taken and where we really have some major issues still to address. Last year, one of my co-presenters was Paul Miadima, representing the communities from South Africa. And he said, it is time for change. And we have to change. As I said, I want to look at where we have changed and where we haven't changed. First, the good news. Responsible travel have removed not only all their orphanage volunteering trips, but a large number of the volunteering trips that give, them an op give volunteers an opportunity to volunteer with children and engage with children. They're not removed indefinitely. They are removed until the sending organizations that want to be listed on responsibletravel.com can prove that they are adhering to some fairly strict guidelines. We worked together with ECPAT, Save the Children, and Responsible Travel on some tough guidelines. And anybody who works with recruiting volunteers and working with children, even if you don't want to work with responsibletravel.com, I urge you to look at those guidelines. They're online, they're available. They're the kind of guidelines any organization should be using if you work with vulnerable children. And vulnerable children is one of the most important issues in volunteering. Most volunteers want to work with either vulnerable children or vulnerable wildlife. Both are exploited, both need strict rules for protection. Another piece of good news, more and more NGOs who are campaigning for child protection, particularly in the volunteer sector, are getting high profiles. Child Safe does amaz amazing work uh, in Southeast Asia, and they're getting a strong high profile. Some bad news. You can still buy a de deal for a few hours engaging one-to-one -one with children. This is an opportunity. You put your bed in. There is a limited period of time. You place your order, and there you are. You can go and engage with children one-to-one. -one just because they're poor. You can still go on orphanage trips. You can still buy a trip as a tourist 
or on voluntourism to visit an orphanage. Where else can you do that? Could you do that in any of the countries we come from? It's completely unacceptable, and it's got to stop. Uh, Rebecca worked with us uh, from Save, Save the Children on the guidelines. And what we need to look at, and the positive news, and what ResponsibleTravel.com, for example, will be promoting, and we people and places promote, you can work with organizations that support children. But those organizations should be doing everything they possibly can to keep those children in their communities and in their families. Some good news. We're seeing volunteer organizations publicize, put on their websites, their child protection policies. So that's Africa Impact and POD. Bad news? This is real back of an envelope research I've been doing recently. I tweeted and asked 90 volunteer organizations, do you have child protection policies in place? 26 of them responded. The, the rest did not respond. Of those 26, 15 declared they had them, but only five of them could give me proof that they had them. 6% who are, and these are volunteer organizations who are offering opportunities to engage with children. Good news, the consumer, the volunteers are beginning to say, up with this we will not put. And that's how we are going to change this. The local people on the ground, it's really difficult for them to say no to sending organizations who will offer them even the smallest amount of money. But the volunteers are now, if you get out there, and this is public, and these organizations are being named, if you get out there onto Facebook, onto the blogs, you can now see the companies that are being named. Large sending organizations who are claiming to send over 5,000 volunteers a year. These guys are doing this kind of damage. This, this, this was a particularly interesting blog with a volunteer who her campaign on Facebook has caused a very large sending organization to readdress the way they're working with orphanages. They're still getting away with it. There's still too many instances of people not responding. This is a young volunteer who arrived and due to pressure of demand from the sending organization, the local partner had only found the orphanage at which she was placed the day before. It ended up that the Ugandan authorities actually closed this orphanage while she was there because it was so bad and her life was threatened. And she's a student. And this organization took thousands of pounds from her. The good news is young volunteers are, can find good advice. Good advice is beginning to arrive. Organizations like Impact International and Learning Service are beginning to give advice on how, what they should be looking for in good organizations. Right. The bad news is that they're still being led to believe they can change the world. The good news is, as I say, there's lots of advice out there now. Lots of advice on the questions they should be asking. The bad news is there's still little help of how to find it. Final people and places promotion, we're going to change that. This year we were campaigning to raise awareness for better child protection. Now we're going to start providing young volunteers, all volunteers, with a directory where they will actually see named organizations that have met core values. So that's, watch out, that's what we're doing this year. Thanks.
I think he's going to talk about some work you do with younger people. Thanks very much. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's David, and um, I come here with a more than one hat on, actually. Um, my main job is working for the London School of Economics, uh, running their volunteer centre. Um, so I have the responsibility of sort of checking organisations before we advertise those opportunities to young people at the university, um, which is obviously an important role, kind of, from what Sally was talking about. Uh, but I also act as a trustee for Kickstart Ghana, um, a small charity uh, that works in Ghana, um, promoting education um, and healthy living through sport. And as part of that, we do send out volunteers to Ghana, um, many of whom are students, um, kind of in that 18 to 24 age bracket. Um, and what I wanted to talk about today was um, you know, how we can make sure we get that right. Um, obviously, it's, it's a booming market. There's a big demand there for young people um, to volunteer overseas. I just wanted to make sure kind of a few best practice tips on that. Um, and finally, I'm also um, on the advisory board for Impact International, um, a small body set up by student hubs, again, promoting best practice amongst volunteers to make sure that they pick the best organization. Um, so firstly, why do I believe in working with young people? Um, unfortunately, young people do get a bit of a bad rep sometimes. Uh, they can get called lazy. Uh, they can get called troublemakers, amongst other things. Um, but I do passionately believe um, in young people. Um, they're motivated, uh, they're ethical, they're educated, and most importantly, engaged, and also very eager to right the wrongs that they see in the world. Um, and some research from NFP Synergy uh, just released this week said that young people are more likely to volunteer than any other age bracket in the UK. So this means we've got this huge amount of young people that are really keen to get involved. They're really keen to change the world that they live in. Um, but there are a few sort of other points on that. However, um, people of all ages would rather treat the symptoms rather than the cause. Um, they can sometimes lose their way without direction. And that's not just for young people. That's for, for any ages again. And... Um, this is often reinforced by what we're seeing from some of the examples that Sally showed um, of what travel companies are offering. Um, and to give you a small example of that, if I Googled yesterday, volunteer in Africa, and this is a screenshot of the first page that came up. Now, what we're seeing here is um, lots of young, predominantly white people volunteering with lots of young Africans. Um, and on all these photos I was looking through, I could only find uh, one African adult on that Google search, which is quite an indictment um, of the sector at the moment, at least what comes up first when young people or anyone is searching to volunteer overseas. Um, so that kind of continues this, this myth almost, that the only way to actually make a difference is to go and directly cuddle or talk to young people and there's no other way that we can actually change the things that are going wrong in the world. So what's this led to? This has led to um, a huge number of opportunities being advertised. And if you Google volunteering overseas, you'll come up with sort of four, five, six million results easily. Um, and then a much smaller number of opportunities that are really making a sustainable difference in the world. And so obviously, yeah, I think this is a bit of a problem. At the moment, it feels like uh, the tail is wagging the dog. Um, companies are thinking, I can make maybe a fair amount of money from sort of recruiting young people and sending them overseas. And now, as we heard again from Sally, I've got to find an opportunity. I've, I've got these young people, they've paid their money. Now I've got to find something for them to do. Whereas in fact, it should be the other way around. You should be looking to address an issue and then thinking, how am I going to do that? And if it involves recruiting volunteers, great, go ahead, do that. That's what we do at Kickstart Ghana. Um, I've got a couple of examples of that coming up in a moment. So I just wanted to go through a few best practice tips again on um, sort of how to work with young people and in fact any volunteers. Um, and the first one, as I was just saying, is make sure that they fit in with your vision, aims and objectives. 
don't make your vision, aims, and objectives about sending young people overseas. Make your vision, aims, and objectives about helping people in whatever society you want to do. And then if young people or any volunteers fit into that, that's the way it should be. Um, make sure you market your opportunities and organization responsibly. And I'll come on to a couple of more examples of that in a moment. Um, put strong recruitment procedures in place. So as we just saw from Sally's presentation, you could book that spot um, to go and volunteer overseas. Now, would you do that for any sort of job um, in the UK? Absolutely not. You need to have um, your job spec, you need to be doing background checks, interviews, application form, and that's, that's just, that should be absolutely standard. That shouldn't be coming from like a, a nice added extra. That should be absolutely standard. Um, ensure the volunteers undergo proper training and make sure they have support pre, during, and post volunteer placement. Um, again, it's, it's unbelievable to think that people are being sent overseas without receiving proper training. Um, either on sort of what it's like to be in that country, living and working there, or what if that's you're going to be undertaking the role. Um, and at Kickstart Ghana, we spend many hours working with each volunteer, making sure they understand exactly what they're going to be doing and what's expected of them when they arrive there. We also, crucially, make sure we set their expectations at a reasonable level. Um, we don't ch tell anyone they're going to be changing the world in sort of four weeks uh, working in Ghana. Um, they might be making a small difference, and hopefully they will make a difference, and hopefully we will see that impact um, over the coming years. But to sort of say you're going to be sent overseas to save the world um, is a little bit much. Um, and related to that, um, set realistic and tangible goals. Um, everyone needs to see what they're doing and how they're getting on. Um, most of all, keep it fun, because volunteering overseas, you know, you can have a smile while you're doing that. Um, and make sure you celebrate and develop your volunteers as well. See what they want to gain from it. So here's a couple of examples of um, what I felt was best practice. Um, the first one is the Accountants for International Development. Um, one minute, no problems. And it just quite simply says, if you want to volunteer with us, we recommend you attend a workshop. Come along and speak to us. And Lively Minds below quite clearly state that you'd be working alongside their staff team. You're not going in by yourself, you're working alongside their staff team. Here's a couple of examples of um, what I'd say isn't particularly best practice. Um, volunteers with qualifications and experience are welcome, but you do not need to have either. That's working with young and vulnerable children, that website came from. Now, if it was your child, would you want someone coming in without any qualifications or experience to look after them? I think not. Um, the one just below that, work with children in a township in Cape Town, 579 pounds or whatever, and below it says, add to your cart. And then you go through and it says, here's your shopping basket, um, working with children. And that um, is one of the biggest providers out there. Um, and that is setting up unrealistic expectations for young people. Um, obviously, um, sort of poverty porn of a small child crying, come, come and help them. Not right. Um, so I just wanted to kind of go through two volunteers um, that we've recruited with Kickstart Ghana. Um, this is Luke. Uh, he was a qualified football coach. Um, he worked with Dyna RFC, a local team that we work with in Ghana. Um, worked with the coaches as well. Um, did, some, did some kind of exchange of ideas with them. Um, and he's also created a training pack for our future volunteers. Um, so they know what to expect and we can continue working with them. Um, and he says that uh, the charity, our charity really has specific goals and he knew how to be a part of that. He fitted in with our goals. We didn't make opportunities for him. Um, and here's another volunteer. Uh, this is Coco. Um, he's from Ghana and he's a change maker in his community. Yeah, we don't just recruit volunteers from the UK. We recruit volunteers from the societies that we work in. And that's not my responsibility. That's the responsibility of the director of our NGO in Ghana to recruit volunteers and to get on with their work. Um, and since he started working us over three years ago, he's uh, helped manage our volunteers, both from Ghana and from the UK. He's built up relationships with our projects, completed financial administration, 
And now we're lucky to say that he's, uh, we're delighted to say that he's um, taken up um, an apprenticeship with Vodafone, um, which we're very proud of him. And we hope that sort of volunteering with Kickstart Ghana has really helped with that. And so finally, just a few conclusions. Um, I want to say that young people are fantastic volunteers. Absolutely. Don't be scared about working with young people. But just make sure you're getting it right. Make sure you're investing your time and resources in them. Make sure your volunteers fit your opportunities and not the other way around. Be responsible with your marketing. A book is absolutely judged by its cover when it comes to this. And uh, finally, celebrate and be proud of your volunteers as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. We're going to hear now from Vicky Smith, who's one of the ICRT alumni, and she's going to be talking more about the marketing side of it. Thank you, Harold. Good morning, everybody. Pause while we get the presentation up. Oh, that's Sally's. <laughs> A little bit about me, I'm going to skip because uh, I've got quite a lot through to get through this morning. Um, so really I just wanted to follow on from what um, Sally and Dave have been speaking about, about marketing and how volunteers start their journey into, or how potential volunteers start their journey into volunteerism. Now this is Philip Kotler, he is the father of modern marketing and his definition of marketing, um, which follows many others, for example Chartered Institute of Marketing, is about it satisfying the needs of a target market of profit. And ultimately, this is what's happening with many companies in the volunteerism industry. They're very commercial, and they're focused on those things. And as a result, they're too easily missing the um, important destination needs and impacts. This is because the target market aren't demanding it. They're shopping around, um, but they're going to Google, and they're coming up, as Dave sort of alluded to earlier, with, with the, the more commercial organizations. Now, marketing is key to responsible tourism and vo responsible volunteering because it's what sets the expectations. And too often, those expectations are being set incorrectly. In the industry, there's no um, standard regulation on volunteerism. There is many guidelines, and can, volunteers are potentially confused between the number of guidelines that are out there equally. And so I think the volunteers have to be smarter in how they're looking. What they tend to do is inevitably go to the internet to search. And this is uh, Google's five stages of travel. They begin with dreaming, and they go on to planning. And in leisure travel, 85% of leisure travelers consider the internet as their main port of call for beginning their planning. With volunteerism, I would actually suggest that's higher. It's a product which has developed largely in the last five to 10 years during internet times, and the channels to market through agents or other um, sales channels haven't developed. So it's probably 95, something to 100 even, 99% in volunteerism. And where volunteers start is with search. And inevitably, they search fairly generic, undifferentiated keywords in looking for volunteer projects. And where the commercial companies, or the big commercial companies went out, is that they've got the budgets and they've got the staff to be able to engage in search engine marketing to an extent that the smaller specialists who are responsible can't compete with. If you compare Keywords such as volunteer abroad, which the average monthly searches on Google is in the thousands, with either responsible volunteering or sustainable volunteering, each of which the average monthly searches is just 10. So Google um, volunteers have to be smarter with search. Ooh, sorry. They also have to be smarter about their motivations. There we've got Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Those motivations for volunteers tend to be those top-level um, needs they're trying to fulfill, self-actualization, esteem, etc. And they're trying to support communities with the lower-level needs. They generally want to help volunteers, and they're generally being sold into projects which might not be helping. Google's third stage of travel is booking. And the internet is increasingly being used because there's a huge amount of transparency in the internet. 
And that's really good for volunteerism. What volunteers aren't doing is shopping around, actually, to the extent that they might do in a normal holiday search. And in a normal holiday search, they're very aware of the consumer protection laws that exist to make sure that they don't buy the wrong thing. In volunteerism, somehow this is sneaking through. Somehow the companies aren't being held accountable for false claims. There's a legal concept called caveat emptor, which says, let the buyer beware. What that says is that the buyer is responsible at his or her own risk and should examine a product for defects and imperfections. Unfortunately, the lack of regulation in volunteerism is meaning that potential volunteers are buying into the wrong thing and they're not taking personal responsibility for what they're buying. They're not looking enough into what they're doing. So they need to be smarter assessing responsibility. They need to not assume anything. They need to not assume that it's charity. The fourth stage of travel is experiencing. And actually, that consumer experience starts much earlier than they arrive in destination. It starts when they start engaging with the travel companies and the volunteerism companies. And the pre-placement information is very important. So they need to sm nurture smarter relationships. That's with the volunteer agencies, the sending agencies, and that's with the projects before they get out there. And if you think if a sending agency is a little bit like a dating agency, they need to really take the time to make sure they're going to get the right match, that they're going to court, that they're going to have sincere intent. Volunteers who just jump at the first opportunity are just heading out on a blind date. So volunteers need to be smarter. They need to look for transparency. And transparency... Sorry, excuse me. Transparency requires honesty. And honesty is clear and specific. It's factual. It's consistent. And that way they can set realistic goals and realistic expectations about what they're going to get when they get to destination. And for the companies, that means that they actually can develop longer relationships with those volunteers, that those volunteers won't be disappointed when they come back and that they can hopefully have a relationship, if we're looking at it in commercial marketing terms, through CRM, that they will continue to volunteer in future years. And so volunteers also need to be smarter. They need to review the evidence. Thank you. If an operator is making a claim, what's the evidence of that claim? They need to ask how all the time. How is that going to happen? How is that shown? How is that proven? And the last stage of travel, according to Google, is sharing. Review your own trips and inspire and inform. We see that TripAdvisor is probably the biggest website in travel these days. Volunteers need to share their reviews when they come back to help potential volunteers in the future find the right projects. And that can be done whether it's on blogs, on Facebook, on Twitter. And in doing so, hold the operators accountable for the experience that they've had. If it's good, those good operators will shine. If it's not so good, they'll be weeded out. So volunteerism is a business, and it's responding to demand. So it's up to the volunteers to demand responsibility, and therefore they need to choose very wisely, and they need to make smarter decisions. And that's involving how they search, their motivations, how they assess, the relationships they build, the transparency, the evidence, and the reviews that they read and write when they come back. And I'd just like to finish on a quote which comes from a blog that actually Sally alluded to earlier, which says, as volunteers, we need to be smarter. We need to dig deeper. We need to hold ourselves, the volunteer organizations, and the orphanages at which we're placed accountable. Otherwise, we readily become part of the problem rather than part of the solution. We doom the very people we came to nurture. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vicky. The final speaker is Nikki White, who is from ABTA, and she's going to be talking about the way ABTA's responded to what happened in the session on volunteering here at WTM last year. Thank you, Harold, and uh, good morning. It's a very scary, tough act to follow uh, three experts when I will profess I am absolutely not an expert. 
Uh, but we are here as ABTA uh, to see what role the trade association can play in volunteering and taking that responsibility. For those of you that weren't here last year, uh, and it's no coincidence that uh, Mark, who said this, is actually on a plane this morning going somewhere else. Uh, he <laughs> asked me to come and actually present because he did have to be somewhere else, otherwise he would have been delighted to follow through on this pledge from last year, saying that ABTA would actually find a way to be part of the solution into better volunteering. It is a very new area for ABTA, I will say. We have a, a broad range of members, from some of the largest corporate members selling package holidays through to much smaller experts in this area. And a lot of the, uh, the organisations that sell volunteering, just to be clear, aren't necessarily ABTA members as well. So we've got to look at where our influence is and what our remit can actually be. Just a few stats before we look at uh, what we're trying to do as ABTA. Um, I was interested to said, uh, have a look at this to get my head around what the, the numbers are from a UK perspective of uh, who is out there volunteering. So from this year's uh, UCAS study, we see that there's 24,000 gap year students which is quite a large number when you think about those people going abroad, what they're doing. Of those, the top things that they wanted to do were teach English abroad and then the work experience and bar work particularly. Must be the, the perks they get with that. And then the second most popular thing was volunteering. So looking at working with local communities or conservation work. So picking up on um, Sally's point earlier, it's very much about touching some of those most vulnerable communities that uh, a volunteering could potentially be going into. These are just some of the things when I was having a look to see what our members are actually selling. Uh, and that follows through from those experiences that volunteers are saying that they want to have. As we said, from the conservation work in some of the, uh, the most uh, difficult parts of the world, through to some of the challenging issues around animal welfare and uh, issues there. And as I said, working with vulnerable people. I was glad that David touched on this because uh, I think said sometimes it's important we look at the, uh, the kind of the, the challenges and the issues that we've got but uh, just going back to remember why people are actually volunteering and that there are positive reasons that the, the volunteers are going out there um, and what they're help, hoping to do and bring back and uh, the kind of people that they want to be later on but I think what we've recognised is that there's a disconnect between the motivations and why people want to volunteer and how the experience that they might actually get. So when we were looking at whose responsibility and looking at our role in this and looking at the trade association, um, I put us there at the bottom with the travel industry because there's a range of players in there. There's the travel agents who people might be going into, there's the tour operators uh, who are actually putting that together and um, said there's a trade association as ourselves here as well. But then the other key players that I thought and the where we can have the influence too the destinations, um, it's very important as well for the destinations that are receiving those volunteers to understand the challenges that volunteers might be facing, but also the type of experiences that are being offered as well and seeing does that actually work well with their destination? How can they work again with us, with the authorities to make sure that uh, we're looking at the issues and raising those and creating that awareness? Because a lot of this can sometimes be about said lack of awareness out there. Also the volunteer, we've heard quite a lot about that this morning um, in terms of what the vol volunteer actually needs to do uh, and the responsibility they need to take in terms of getting the right information beforehand and really questioning what it is they're going to do. And the link there, I think we, ha we haven't just uh, touched on that yet this morning, is about parents as well. Um, particularly said if it's children that are going out uh, who are just in that first stage of adulthood uh, looking at experiences, how can the parent help educate and uh, guide them through the, the complexity of the information out there so in terms of the parent, in terms of where we're actually now, uh, take the parent one first. Um, these are just some of the things I'll just quickly talk through because I know we're tight on time. But for some of the ways when we started from last year thinking about, okay, ABTA hasn't uh, really touched on the volunteering side yet, so where can we take this? And we're just starting to review some of the things we've already got in place uh, that do actually uh, touch on the volunteering issues without actually recognising it and bringing that together. Uh, so one of the things that we've been heavily involved in um, has been the review of the BSI standard, um, which is about adventurous activities. But that very closely links to um, the activities that uh, volunteers might be out there doing. And there's a very good piece in there, I encourage you to actually look at it as well, because there's a very strong piece in there for parents and guidance on how you can actually help and think about the activities that uh, your uh, said child might be doing when they're off uh, volunteering and talking through some of these key issues that have come out today, those are very, very clearly defined in the specific page on uh, guidance for parents. 
I touched on the ABTA Code of Conduct because uh, um, Harold challenged us and said, could we not put volunteering into the overall Code of Conduct? Uh, that's a longer term uh, aim, which uh, would be great to have, but it's certainly not where we're at at the moment, and we need to uh, go through quite a few steps before we could get there. But the reason that I put it up is something that is happening now is that it does have the ability to look at people who are mis-selling. So if, uh, if one of our members is mis-selling something and misrepresenting um, the kind of product that the volunteers are having, then there is a course of address through the code of conduct in that respect. So there is, uh, said, an element there already. Some of the, the work that my department does is very much on safety uh, and security. So it's looking at that guidance as well, uh, both from through the range of the um, activities that BSI are doing, and then also our work with suppliers in destinations, looking at uh, the accommodation and all of the other aspects as well, making sure that those volunteers are safe when they're there, and that the security is thought about from their point of view too. Likewise, the risk management. So when uh, tour operators are actually putting these volunteering experiences together, how are they actually uh, looking at the potential risks that are there. And there are a number of risk management systems out there, but are they thinking about that in the same way for volunteering and making sure that that's worked through in the same way? Just this year, we've also launched our animal welfare guidance, uh, which is looking at trying to get some best practice standards um, in place of the fact that there aren't global uh, standards on animal welfare. And the reason for this as well, bringing this up here, is that said, many of the activities we've seen in some shape or form do involve uh, interaction with animals, and particularly on the conservation side. So how can we bring that into our volunteering practice as well? We also, for members, run operational bulletins, uh, which are about advice and assistance. And that very much goes to the heart of if volunteers are in a particular destination at a time and an issue does happen, we saw it this year in, um, in Malaysia, Borneo areas, where the, the travel advice changed when people were actually out there. How do we get that information out to um, the, the operators that are working um, with, the, with the volunteers so that they know the appropriate uh, course of action to take to keep people safe while they're said, in a destination that might be having challenges? And that links very much to the Know Before You Go partnership that we have with the Foreign Office. That's trying to help people raise awareness and think about things like customs and culture. I think, uh, unfortunately, sadly, too many people don't think about the place they're going to before they actually go and learn more. And trying more and more to encourage people, and certainly through the Foreign Office campaign as well, is to really think about the destination they're going to and learn about the, said, the local customs and cultures so they don't fall foul of the rules there. And finally, our work with uh, destinations. Uh, one of the key things we do is actually go around and see destination authorities talking about key challenges in their countries. And this is where we can actually, going forward, can bring uh, the volunteering issues into this more. So just to touch on where we're going forward next, um, said it's, it's unfortunately things don't always move really fast. And when you're a membership uh, association, having to work with the members as well and people at different places, we have to be cognizant of that. So over the last uh, year, we've been working on a new statement of commitment, uh, which we'll actually be launching in the next uh, couple of months, which is very much about sustainable uh, volunteer experiences. And that gives out uh, some top-line guidance at this stage, which will develop into further guidance on the different issues for our members who do actually um, sell these type of experiences. And that looks at everything from pre-departure right through to when they're there, to when they actually, to when they're bringing volunteers back, and how we can actually said, learn and bring in that information and to keep improving that. Because we're not about having a statement of commitment that just is put there, nobody sort of really looks at, but we know it's kind of there, it's been signed. How does that actually action, and how can we keep improving that and the experiences? Our role as an association as well is very much about broadening awareness. So when these issues come to light and working with the experts that we heard on today, the more we know about the issues and that we can um, help members understand how to t uh, challenge and tackle these as well, that's part of the role that we can actually offer. Um, as I said just on the previous slide about widening those destination partnerships, there are some key countries we work with now, but uh, we also need to have a look at which are the main countries facing the issues with volunteering that we can actually take forward and develop um, said those relationships with further and raise these awareness across the piece. And finally, as our kind of main role as ABTA, we're here for our members to actually provide that ongoing support and guidance. And we recognize, said, that we're, we're still just on the first stages of this journey when that relates to volunteering. Uh, but it's certainly something that, said, we're not now shying away from. These issues are out there. We're trying to see how we can face them. We're not the experts. We need to work with the experts on this. Uh, but we are taking those first steps to look at, said, how we can get wider industry participation, 
how we can bring in that um, uh, other critical voices that we work with. And certainly on our statement of commitment, we didn't uh, develop that just by ourselves. We looked at the experts and we've worked with those uh, said critical voices to really engage on these issues. We've had a, a long-standing relationship with ECPAT on child protection and uh, guidance that we've developed for members over the years. But now that said, it's broadening more into the volunteering side as well. And finally, as I said, what we want to do is share those learnings for that continued development and keep improving uh, what we can offer and the guidance we can then feed back to members. So hopefully I've kept within my six minutes and given you a taste of what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikki. So over to you. We have 20 minutes for questions. Who wants to go first? <laughs> 